Thank you very much for the possibility to talk here on such a special occasion. Um, sadly, I'm the last speaker of this special convention, and as the last speaker, it's always a blessing and a burden at the same time. A blessing because it's mainly the, the last impression of such a convention, and the burden because it's unfortunately the last impression of such a convention, because it could be good or either really, really bad. But let's have a look. Um, last week, as I was preparing for this talk, I stumbled across a newspaper article from the German newspaper Welt, and it was um, between, uh, it was reporting about an interview of Jens Junge, the leader of the Department of Ludology in Berlin, and the game developer Zwiet Sausch from Tucana Interactive. And Junge highlighted the close interaction of video games and board games and the influences on one another. The studio Zausch works in is responsible for the video game Dorfromantik. Maybe some of you know that video game. How many, maybe a show of hands, how many doesn't, do know the video game? Board Game 2. Board Game 2, that was my next question. And who of, of you know the board game? And there's a huge difference, exactly what I want to talk about too, because the board game, and that's very interesting, interesting uh, it won actually the prize game of the year. So this transition is also very important nowadays also in our society, because these board games coming from video games are also taking part in our culture. Uh, looking at the transition of such board games to video games and vice versa, we firstly think about older board games which were simply digitalized, such as, for example, chess, Cluedo Risk, Pictionary, The Settlers of Catan, maybe, and so on. The digitalization and the internet made it possible to play such games with uh, people all over the world or to keep in contact with remote friends, for example. Um, but a similar effect happened also in the opposite direction. Video games, originally designed to be played alone or online with people you don't even know, started to become board games so you can enjoy them with your real life friends. These games range from simple classics like Pac-Man you can see here and we all know from the arcades, and to more modern games like for example This War of Mine, Frostpunk, or the already mentioned Dorf Romantic as you can see here, or Anno 1800. It is obvious that such games sometimes undergo huge changes in their game style. There is no machine which is responsible for a lot of background processing, calculations, and in-game changes. Players of board games are responsible for every change of the game. The game must become less complex to be playable and to be understandable by the consumers without having such a thick book as a manual and without managing a lot of processes of lesser importance and therefore uh, losing maybe the interest of the game at the end. So I want to present the fact of money in Anna 1800 and how the game had to change with this transfer into a board game. And therefore I want uh, to introduce you into my mythology. I used the HGP method uh, designed by Eugen Pfister and Arno Gürgen. Uh, then uh, the Anno series design as a whole, maybe I will cut that part a bit shorter. Uh, then the concept of workforce in Anno 1800 because that's a new implemented design in that uh, game. And then the two concepts of money, be it in the video game and the board game. Um, the HGP method is... Um, yeah, it's, it's based on a, a communication model, more or less. It's, it's an analysis model of the German communication scientist Marion Müller and the tripartite film analytic model of Helmut Korte. And it consists of three steps, the production analysis, the product analysis, and the reception analysis. Those three parts are more or less self-explanatory. So let's um, move on to the first part. It's the production analysis. And it's not that easy because normally you would need some interviews with the developers to talk about the difficulties and so on. But the problem with those developers is that they are, um, yeah, they've got full disclosure uh, agreements. So there is no real information you can get from them. Um, what is the most important thing um, that in Anno 1800, in general, as all the, other, all the other other titles designed since 1998, 
um, are based on different concepts, all thinking about economic growth, about imperialism, colonialism, globalization, and with the newer titles, becoming really, really large games. So at the moment, if I'm thinking about Anno 1800, for example, you play in the old world, you play in South American colonies, you play in African colonies, you play in the Arctic uh, region, and now with uh, modders, so with player-based region, you have a fifth region also added. So there is a lot of different gameplay designed all in one game. Um, as you can see here, there are a lot of concepts. I want just to focus on the economic growth and on the money itself, but there would be a huge potential uh, to do further analysis on such games. Um, Fister and Gergen already stated that the production analysis of, of big game production is difficult, um, but I try to highlight the most important cornerstones and what makes Anno 1800 so special in its development compared to the first six title, titles. Um, because Anno 1800 was published in two, uh, 2019 with four season passes with a total of 12 DLCs and a considerable amount of cosmetic, uh, cosmetic packages. And the so-called Anoholic developed itself, so that's a player who really is, um, yeah, kind of, yeah, he just wants to use Anno all the time. He's not addicted, I would say, because that's so negatively put. Um, he just wants to play Anno as a full-time job. Um, Anno 1800 was the first game of the Anno series which uh, was developed together with the players, so the players had a, um, an access in the developing. They had to, they could uh, uh, give some inputs, and that was really the one thing that makes difference between all the other games, because I know 2250, for example, was a huge flop. There was a lot of uh, negative review, so and therefore I've got here also a comparison with Anno 2070, which is very interesting. And if you have there a look, for example, at the gross revenue in the comparison, uh, Anno 1800, even if it's a newer, and, or maybe even a bigger title, it has a lesser revenue, but uh, bigger average, average playing time of the players. So those players who are playing Anno 1800 are playing more and a longer time and investing more energy in the game than the players who play Anno 2070 and just bought the game, the base game. Um, but let's move on into the game itself. Anno 1800 brings up a new kind of resource and with it a new but very influential game mechanic, the workforce. While older Anno titles didn't care for how much people the player provides for and how many workers someone would need to sustain a huge industry, Anno 1800 implemented five different classes of workforce, the farmers, the workers, the artisans, the engineers, and the investors. The work every type of building needs, um, the work, uh, to work, every type of building needs a different type and a different amount of workforce, leading to an increased need of population relative to the growth of the player's empire. By increasing the population, the player is obliged to provide even more resources and products to sustain all the needs, and he is faced with the difficult task of balancing three main factors. The amount of workforce, the number of resources and products, and the income. If the players involve themselves in war and therefore uh, building a huge military and island defense, they also need to have an adequate economy to sustain it, which can be quite difficult in bigger conflicts as supply routes from island to island can be easily blocked and space on your main island is of the essence. Let's have a look if this works. So here on the left upper corner, for example, we can see uh, the money itself. So this is now rather um, advanced. Um, game statues. On the left upper corner you see the, uh, the, the money as a whole, on the, then the balance the player has at the moment, then the population of the world, and in the center the different types of workforce split up, from the left to the right, from the farmers to the engineers. The fifth uh, population isn't shown here because the investors do not work anymore, they are no available workforce, they are used for other things. 
as one of the three already highlighted factors, money impedes the game the most and from the start as a constant. A lot of the starting settings are designed around money or incidents, which can only be resolved by investing even more money. The biggest hindrance at the beginning is the start capital, which at higher difficult setting, settings can lead to more hurdles given by the high building costs, such as, for example, the shipyard or then later the bank, which costs uh, just a huge amount of that money. For example, at the beginning you start normally with 25,000 of that capital, a shipyard costs 10,000, a bank costs 100,000, so you have to have a positive economy. This here now, for example, is uh, another game status at an earlier stage, and here in the early stage, for example, we've got a problem that we've got a negative balance, with, which is shown red, and in the center we've got also a negative workforce, and we have also no resources left, so we are now, um, we have now the problem that we need more resources to get a higher population, and with that higher population then gain more money to get a positive balance in the end. Um, further settings influence the whole game, the income in general, the upkeep of inactive buildings, the refund of construction costs, and so on and so on. A lower quest frequency stops the player from gaining too much money from outside, and the skyscraper upkeep is a problem for the late game. So until a functioning and well-balanced economy is established, the player is forced to prioritize important and money-efficient aspects of the game, therefore forced to capitalist thinking. Providing labor for all inhabitants, and realistically put, providing a basis of living isn't the main object of the game. It is just important to have a thriving economy feasible by a high income generated to a high population. What's about the board game? Anno 1800, the board game works slightly different. Every player doesn't start from ground zero, but with a few basic buildings for generating resources and a few farmers and workers. The game consists mainly of the producing of goods and, use the, and using them for a big variety of actions. But the players are limited to one action each round. Most of the actions are based on goods, as you can see here. For example, canned food, chocolate, etc., clothes, cigars, rum, and so on. Goods can only be produced using different types of workforce. Higher class workforce can produce more valuable goods. All products must be immediately invested, again, mostly for buildings or for using different playing cards, gaining some advantages or points, the so-called influence points, which are the same things as victory points by the end. The already used workforce, shown in the board game with colored cubes, so here on the left side, here in the, in the center or here on the different buildings, must be individually paid with gold to be usable again. So the price raises with the class. So we've got here the five different classes, the, the farmer, the worker, the, uh, the artisan, the engineer, and the investor. And to get them back, they have a different wage, and you have to pay them, more or less. But you can also decide to have a city festival, and therefore then gaining all your workforce back, and you can use them once again. Bear with me, because now comes the theoretical part. The third and the last part is the reception analysis, which as described as the last step by Pfister and Gergen, is the most difficult part of the method, as it leads to an extreme expenditure of time for very little usable information. There are no reviews talking about the concept of money in-game, and therefore it is difficult to apply a true reception analysis. Therefore, I connect the just given product analysis with the re theories of Marx and other theorists about capital and capitalism to substantiate my theory that even though money is no core element of the board game, it has still highly capitalist characteristics, so to highlight how the money in those two games can be perceived, be it with or without the knowledge of the user. Finding a satisfying definition of the word capitalism regarding to its history of conflict between the East and the West and without invoking the anger of neoliberalists is a difficult task. Christine Resch and Heinz Steiner succeeded in explaining the capitalist system and its history. There are two types of labor, the domestic labor and wage labor. In the 19th century, the latter prevailed over domestic labor, on the one hand through the heroism of industrial labor and on the other through the mass consumption of Fordism. And with Anno 1800, we are exactly in that time period and are evolving around the ambivalence of labor. 
Furthermore, they argue that everyone involved in the production process should achieve a positive balance and is therefore forced to be as productive and efficient as possible, as a laborer and a part of the now industrialized and capitalist structured society. Transferred to the video and board game, this principle is still clearly recognizable. Each worker or group of workers is assigned a direct measurable output. In the video game, this can also be viewed via statistics, as you can see here. There is a huge amount of statistics the, the developers put in Anno 1800. So you've got here um, a different charge in the center, the finance charge. You've got here, for example, the balance generated from the income um, and the expenses for all the administration and the buildings of your game. And on the right side, also the income generated by each different class. So you can really do an analysis of your own um, development. Um, I thought about picking one of the most important productions to show you the main mechanic of those statistics and to focus on money they convey. And we can see here the beer, the most important thing. The players inspect each production on each island or in generally individually, overseeing how much they are producing and needing for their population. So on the right side, you got a statistic on how much of the resources you produce. For example, here you can see uh, grain, uh, which you need for the beer production. And on the left side, you can see on the blue scale how much beer there is needed, on the green scale how much beer there is provided, and also the amount of money you can generate just by uh, providing that beer to your population. And if you have a comparison with the uh, statistics before, at the moment we have a surplus of just 2,400. At the moment, our beer is crumbling because we are losing every tick about nine beer in our uh, storage. So by the end, if we are losing our beer, we are losing also this money or this um, part of our balance, and then our economic growth is going to the negative, and then we are mainly losing the game. And remember that if you have no money left in the end, you lost the game at all. So maybe after 12 or 15 hours of gameplay, you can lose the game just simply by running, running out of money. Having a look at the time, I won't present you that um, very interesting detail of Marx, but maybe, maybe the last sentence. Accumulation of capital is multiplication of the proletariat. So mainly he's saying that if people want to invest, they do not invest solely money, they invest into people because people are workforce and workforce are in the end generating the money um, and by producing goods. Hence, the capital the player gains, controls and invests is based on the workforce he develops in the course of the game. According to Moore and his influential work, Capitalism in the Web of Life, such a growth goes according to the expansion in the world and according to geographical conditions. Furthermore, as Moore states, the production of surplus value is not only the proletarianization proletarianization of labor and the accumulation of capital, but the production of global spaces and of appropriation. And that's the thing I already mentioned too, because in the game there are, is the possibility of those five regions I already mentioned, but also in the board game, you've got the possibility to grow and to expand on further islands or even into the new world. So we've got here the concept of, global, of, global, of globalization, we've got the concept of colonial, colonialism, therefore we've got the concept of capitalism, and therefore it's always evolving around money. Um, in parallel to Pfista and Chickler's case study on civilization, Anno 1800 can also be described as a game of constant, further and higher development. Even if this is made possible less by researchable technologies than by population and supply. It is the increasing further development, the increasing efficiency, and the ever decreasing importance of lower classes of the population that distinguish the game Anno 1800 as capitalist. This culminates in the class of investors who are shown and valued as the fifth and highest class of society and, ho and who no longer belong to the labor force and thus to the proletariat. These only serve to generate influence, a special currency in the game, which in contrast to money has much 
greater significance in the late game. By that point, money is already available in abundance as the player needs a big and stable economy for them to reach such a, an advanced game status. Interestingly, in the board game, the highest class investor fulfills the same task. He is just of importance if the player wants to get a lot of influence points, aka victory points. The investor has no point in the introduction and therefore is the signal of capitalism itself. He himself is the one furthest away from a resource or a product and therefore has little to no contribute to the value of each product itself. As a conclusion, Workforce is split into different classes and they are still for enforcing capitalist tendencies. Space and globalization are part of a growing economy and economic growth is in the center of the gameplay. So the investors, for example, are the beacon of such a system. The board game has no money for maintenance, for buying, etc. But the board game is using gold as a wage, but not in the form of a normal currency, because you can also use, his, use it in another dimension. For example, which I forgot earlier, you can also trade with gold. So you can trade with other players, you can also trade those goods, and you, you pay for, the, uh, for those goods with trading points, not with that gold. But as a, yeah, a little small token, as a gift in addition, um, the player producing that good is receiving one gold. But it doesn't matter if it's a lesser good, just uh, like a piece of wood, or if it's a really uh, high-valued good, just as cigars or rum, as uh, shown you earlier. So overall, the board game is still of capitalist tendency without money as a factor, even though it is partially replacing it. And board games can still convey the ideas of growth and capitalism without having currency or money. So in my opinion, even though there is no money to be touchable, as we've seen also in the talk before, there can still be a big idea of money going around in every game and also in our life. And all also, our last three days consisted just about money. Thank you for your attention. Okay.